Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us say, confess our sins to God our Father.
comfort by the same Spirit, that I right understanding in all things, and evermore to rejoice in His holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <laughs> Of us in his own native language. 
Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Amphilia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, among them, said that they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Day number 50. And on 
Pentecost, that was 50 days in the Bible stories we read too today. 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead is when the Holy Spirit came to the disciples. Right? And you heard the story, and there were flames of fire above their heads, right? And they spoke in different languages, talking to other people about Jesus and what Jesus had done in his death and resurrection. Right? And because of that, Pentecost sometimes is a day where churches focus on the gospel of Jesus being talked about also in all the different languages. Now, does anybody here know a different language? Anybody? A little bit? Yeah? A little bit of some other ones, yeah. Do you guys know that even in our Kindles, we have um, songs that have different languages in it? Did you guys know that? Mm -hmm. So one of our, one of my favorite songs, and I know it's a favorite in Lutheran churches, um, this is um, 657. It's a mighty fortress is what I'm But if you look right here, you also have words in a different language. You have words in Spanish. Right? And this hymn, A Mighty Fortress, that wasn't written in English. That was actually written in German. Right? So we have, just in this one book, we have songs that were written in Latin, in German, in Greek, in Russian, in English, in French, in Swahili, yeah, in Spanish, and all these other languages. And we get them now written in English so that we can understand them as well. Right? That's pretty amazing, don't you think? That we have all these different languages. But no matter what language it is, here in our Kindle, in our Bibles, that we have the chance to hear it in a language we can understand. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's an important part, too, that we can understand what God has to say about Jesus. Okay? So, think about that, too, when we go out um, and say, you guys, go wherever we may go tomorrow, um, a lot of you are having school already. So, wherever you guys go, we can hear the word of God in the language that we know and can understand and hear and believe in Jesus. So, let's say a little prayer, all right? So, hold your hands and repeat after me. Heavenly Father, send your spirit to us that we might hear and believe and speak of Jesus in his name.
Christ, all to heaven. Amen. Today, uh, as we celebrate this festival of Pentecost, again, as you spoke to, uh, to the children, a lot of that's focused on how the Word of God is able to be spread throughout the world in a lot of the different languages. And the continued work that the church needs to do in communicating that Word of God in a language that people can hear and understand. So much so that even um, this year, the LCMS, the entire city, the focus as we gather in convention this year and then over the next three years, is on translating the Bible and other resources in other languages so that that Word of God can continue to be spread. And a very good example of that really is just that hymn that we say. It's a hymn that's composed by Martin Luther, but was based, the first verse anyways, was based off of an older Latin chant. So in that one hymn itself, we have Latin represented, German, and now English. So that we might hear again about the Holy Spirit and the work that He does in our lives. And then proclaim that to others. And part of that, and one of the readings that we usually hear on this Sunday, is from Genesis chapter 11. And that's another chapter in which we hear about some different languages. But kind of the opposite of what we were just talking about here. Chapter 11 of Genesis, we hear the story, the account of the Tower of Babel. This is a very familiar story for a lot of Christians, and one that a lot of us probably remember hearing um, in Sunday school or maybe even in children's <coughs> Bibles. But oftentimes, we don't really explore just how significant and what exactly is going on in light of this, particularly in connection with Pentecost. So that's what we're going to do this morning. So, first, just a little bit of context. In the previous chapters in Genesis, we hear the account of Noah, and the ark, and the flood, and all of the things that happened from there on out. And after Noah and his family exit the ark, and they start to, um, in a sense, rebuild civilization afterwards, um, we quickly then get into a genealogy of sorts, um, just like we do after the Tower of Babel as well. And this account now of the Tower of Babel takes place then about 100 years after the flood. Ham one of Noah's sons, Ham and his grandsons, who had forgotten the wrath of God in that great flood, end up despising Noah and God's work because they forgot about it. And now, it's these descendants that want to make a name for themselves. And they want to do this in particular because they do not want to be scattered. And that's what the text here in Genesis 11 says. Lest they be scattered. Now, just a reminder, when God created, at the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, He blessed them, and He said, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. And then, after Noah and his family exit the ark, he tells them the exact same thing. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. But that's not exactly what the people really want to do. They don't want to be scattered all <coughs> over the earth. They want to gather all together. And they're worried, maybe in a certain sense, that they will be scattered. They kind of don't believe it. But they don't want to take their chances either. And so they build up this tower. They want to be remembered because of this. They want to make that name for themselves. And they certainly do. Probably not the way in which they really intend. And so, 
They build this tower, and by doing that, they actually show their contempt for God and what God has in store for them. And the emphasis of this entire passage here really lies on their saying, let us build ourselves a city and a tower. It's not just let us do this, but let us build it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right? Not for God, not for His glory, not for His church, but really, in essence, to suppress the church. Because they want to build a name, they want to be remembered. So, they build it high, all the way up to the heavens. Now, high, how high? Um, there's guesses and there's speculations. But certainly not high enough to somehow reach up mm -hmm. to God himself. But spiritually, that is really what they are trying to do. They're trying to reach up to God. Because this place was also to be a place of worship. But not a worship of God himself, necessarily, but a worship of their own name, of their own accomplishments, of their own deeds. Because, again, they'd forgotten that this was the kind of thing that led to the flood in the first place. And what they're doing is just reiterating, recommitting that same old sin of idolatry. It's plain and simple. And maybe worst of all, they didn't consider that God would notice and that God would pay attention. But really, isn't that the way it is for all sin? Right? While the sinner is engaged in sinning, he doesn't really see God, doesn't really speak to him, not really aware of him. And the sinner assumes that God doesn't see and he isn't really aware of what he's doing. And it's not just them, but we do the same kind of thing. I mean, how many times do we commit a sin and we do it in privacy, right? Whether that's the privacy of our own heads or the privacy of our own homes, whatever it may be. But we somehow think, as long as nobody else sees it, then it really isn't that bad. Mm -hmm. But we know better, right? We know that God sees, that God watches, but we don't always act that way. But if we actually did believe that and act that way, how do you think that would change the way we live our lives? Especially when we're by ourselves, right? Or away from the prying eyes because we're afraid of human judgment, of what others might think, but aren't always necessarily as afraid of God's judgment and what God might think. So it's almost ironic in the way that this written in Genesis 11. They're trying to build up this tower all the way up to heavens, you know, and acting as if God won't really notice. And then God himself has to stoop down to even see what they're trying to accomplish. Here they are thinking they're all mighty and grand and doing this magnificent thing. And to God, this is just puny tower. <laughs> This little bitty work of human hands in which they're trying to make their own name and exalt. And what does God do? In essence, it's almost like he laughs. In fact, we talked about this a lot in our Bible study this morning, didn't we? From Psalm chapter 2, where God sees the nations raging and the vanity and the uselessness of their rebellion against him. And in Psalm 2, it says, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. In other words, he's mocking them. Since none of this poses any kind of threat to God himself. And then the psalmist goes on to say, Then he will speak to them in his wrath, and tear them in his, or say to them in his fury, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So here are the people of God thinking on there, building this gigantic tower and mountain up to the heavens. And God says, no, I'm going to set my king on my mountain, my holy hill, that is Zion. 
And you and I, we know exactly what this is talking about, don't we? We know that this king that is being talked about is Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. The king who on that Mount Zion was crucified, died and was buried, and the one who ascended into heaven and now sits on the very throne of God himself. And this Jesus, who's not only the Savior, but this Jesus is the king and is the judge over both the living and the dead. So we should take this whole account as a warning that the longer that God puts up with our idolatry and sin, the longer he allows us to try to build up the works of our own hands, our own efforts to make a name for ourselves, the longer he seems to pay no attention to it, the more intolerable his wrath will actually be. And so he does give out his wrath to those people. But notice what he doesn't do first. First, he doesn't say he squashes the tower or tears down the walls. But instead, what does he do? First, he confuses their languages. And this is why it's called the Tower of Babel, because in Hebrew, the word Babel sounds like the Hebrew word for confusion. Because that's all kind of they hear now as they talk to one. And what it shows us is what the people of God, it goes down to the heart of the matter, what the people of God were unwilling to do through rejection and forgetting of God's word that God does for them. He confuses their languages and then he scatters them so that they might fill the world and do what he has told them to do. Now, in some sense, this may seem to be really kind of a light punishment. You don't have any lightning bolts from heaven coming down and striking people dead. You don't have another flood washing them all the way. All you have is confusing the languages and then sending them out all over the world. But when we take into consideration that extreme hardship that, re that results from the division of language, then we understand that a little bit more. I mean, if anybody here has ever gone into another place where a different language is being spoken, you don't have English, that's hard, right? It's a challenge to try to understand what's being said and what's being communicated, not just even in verbal language, but also in the way that people act, right? The way they motion and use their hands, their facial expressions, all of that. It's a challenge to do that sort of thing. And in part, that's because of the importance of language itself. Language is part of our identity, isn't it? And it creates a bond, language and culture, and the relationship that exists between all of this is all very interrelated. And so when God confuses the languages here, he's not just confusing the way that they communicate, but it's also illustrating the confusion that exists between God and man itself because of the sinfulness. And that confusion now exists between people. Now just like we don't always understand the cultures around us, there exists a natural opportunity when you have a confusion of languages for anger and distrust. But the divisions between God and man and between one another, they can't and they won't be fixed by working hard, by building up our own powers, by making a name for ourselves, no matter how big and grand it might be. Notice at this time, and ever since the Tower of Babel, there is no solution for the confusion and the animosity that exists between the cultures and the languages. But then we come to Pentecost. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit provides the healing for the punishment and the solution for the problem. In our Gospel reading, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will teach, He will help, 
and he will comfort. And part of the way that he does that is by healing the divisions that exist first and foremost between God and man, and then between one another. And this spirit doesn't work apart from the word of God, which is to say that he uses that word to teach you. And it's that word of Christ that he uses to bring the healing of the brokenness of our relationship and the hope that we have in Christ. And so then as the Spirit comes to the disciples, it's not just so that they can interact and make better business deals with each other. It's not just for cultural exchange or something like that. It's so that the Word of God might go out to the world. It's that others might hear of the name of Jesus, and through hearing the Word of God, they might believe in the God who has come to save. And that is the great miracle of Pentecost. A reversal, in essence, of Babylon, not just of language, but a reversal of the division between God and man and between men himself. And bringing that kind of healing and unity which only exists through the word of God that brings the reconciliation by the death of Jesus right into the language, to the ears, to the culture of the entire world. It's like God is gathering together again the many flocks of the world into that one fold, and this is Christ's blessing. And since it's common to all this word of God, the differences in our outer life should cause no kind of now, it's a great weekend to have Pentecost because it fits really well with this. It's Memorial Day, right? Weekend. On Memorial Day, we remember those that have given their life for our country, right? In our country, part of the beauty of our country is wrapped into one of the models about this, and it reads something like this in Latin, right? E pluribus. You all remember what that means? Out of many, one. Right? So you get people from various cultures coming together to be one country, one people, one nation. Right? This is exactly the kind of thing that happens at Pentecost. Not united by living in the same land or the same area, but united by the same gospel. Many united into one, into the very body of Christ. That means your identity. Your primary identity is not based on your language. It's not based on your ethnicity, your culture, your traditions, your nationality, your sexuality, your gender, or any of the towers that we may erect. But it's based in Christ. It's based in Christ. Not too long ago, I was talking to, uh, online to a friend of mine who um, is an Eastern Orthodox priest and involved, or knows people that are involved in the conflict and the war that's been going on between Russia and Ukraine. And from his perspective, and I think he's right, one of the saddest aspects of this is the division between the Christians. That it is Christians fighting against Christians. That the nationalities and the differences and the politics and economics, all of that should be second to the unity that they have in Christ. And that's the unity that we have. And maybe nowhere else is this seen more closely than when we commune together. Where Christ comes and has fellowship with us. And it's only through Christ again that that's where unity is found. So when we come here and we kneel down together and eat of the one bread and drink of the one cup, we are reminded that we are members of the one body, of Christ's body. Brothers and sisters, not strangers, not competitors, and not even opposed to each other. And this is no common connection or cheap fellowship. This is a high and a holy unity and a calling. 
So last week, as you all know, my family and I we went to Fort Wayne, right, for the graduation ceremony. And while we were there, I thought this was very, very interesting, actually. There were seven PhD candidates. There were four of the kind of doctorate that I got, doctor of ministry, seven PhD candidates. Out of these seven PhD candidates, six of them were from Africa. Six of them were from Africa. Two of them hardly spoke a word of English. And yet the unity that we had as we joined together in worship and could come and receive the body and the blood of Christ next to each other, even though I didn't even know how to introduce myself, that that unity is a stronger bond than anything else that we can share in life. It's the reversal of battle, of God unifying his people, still scattered throughout the world and doing what they're supposed to do. But the unity of the body of Christ around the very Son of God who has come to us. And so that power of battle warns us then that we need to be on guard against our own self-righteousness, on guard lest we fall away from the word of God and try to prefer to do something that we think is better or higher. Because where the word of God is ignored or not present, Christ isn't present either. And there, the punishment of Babel continues. Not a division of language, but a division of sin. A division from the absence of the word of God. The Tower of Babel also points us to the solution, to Pentecost, to the work of God's Spirit in our lives which unifies us in that body of Christ. In that word of God that reconciles God to man through the gospel of Jesus, the very mighty deeds of God. <coughs> May that word of God continue to go out into the world so that all who can hear may believe. And all who believe may confess and call upon that name of Christ and be saved. Because we have peace. The peace between God and man and that peace which passes all understanding. That will guard the hearts and minds of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to please rise. And we give our common witness to the faith that we have by confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God,
May your spirit create faith in the hearts of the nations, that on that great and magnificent day of our Lord, that they may call upon the name of your Son and be saved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, when you filled the disciples with the Holy Spirit, 3,000 souls were called, gathered, invited, and sanctified. Likewise, fill our congregations, our synod, and the whole Christian church on earth with the Holy Spirit. Renew us, O Lord, that the sacraments may be administered faithfully, and that many more may be called by the gospel, enlightened with your gifts, sanctified and kept holy in the one true faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, I'm supposed to give thanks for those who have served our nation through military service. And we remember especially with gratitude those who gave their lives for us in our cause of freedom. Help us to honor their sacrifice by using our liberty with responsibility and in accordance with God's word. Keep safe all who travel this weekend. Bless our nation and help us to protect and increase the privileges we have for those who follow, looking always to you, from whom all our gifts come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Light in this dark world, you have sent your Holy Spirit to your church as our good company. Soothe the wounds of your people, and according to your will, bring restoration to broken families. Peace where there is division, heal the sick, uplift the depressed, provide for the poor, uphold the forgotten, and answer the prayers of all who call out to you. We pray especially for Peg Forney, as she mourns the death of her son unexpectedly this week, and for Joy Adams and her sister. Grant healing, comfort, and peace in your time of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, giver of the Spirit, clear away all distractions so that our hearts and minds may be focused on you. As Christ comes to us in the bread in which his body and the cup of his blood, help us to receive your gifts of faith and to live from them. Receive our praise and thanksgiving together with the tithes and the offerings we bring as tokens of our trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, love give to those who weep the joy of your presence, to those who grieve the hope of resurrection, to those who are alone or afraid of the consolation of your spirit, that they may not despair, but know the joy of your presence and the love of your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Father, with your Son, Jesus, send your spirit into our hearts through your word to rule and govern us according to your will. Comfort us in temptation and defend us against every error. That we may continue steadfast in the one true faith. That we might increase in love and good works. And trusting in your grace by the death of Jesus, obtain eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we present our tithes and offerings before the Lord as we continue on by singing our offertory.
give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who ascended above the heavens and sitting at your right hand, poured out on this day the promised Holy Spirit on his chosen disciples. For all this, the whole earth rejoices with exceeding joy. Therefore, the angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and sing.
Yeah.